I, I think I had now uh, four people make the same observation to me. Uh, different words, same observation, and it's perfect because it introduces the rest of our session. What I tried to do for the first hour and a half is define the problem. What we're going to try to do for the second half hour and a half is solve the problem. Because with the Trump and Sanders scenario, they have defined the problem and haven't worried about the solution. Uh, we got to worry about a solution here. And so let me take you deep. Uh, reading is one of the keys. We've always known that. Uh, but I want to suggest to you it's a little bit different than we might think. Here's a study that's been done three times. I'm going to ask you to yell the answers back. How many times? Three. 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 Okay. And remember, I'm going to give you the PowerPoint and white papers. This is uh, this slide will have an entire white paper behind it because you you may want to give it to the people who have a responsibility for literacy in your districts. Uh, what we did was go to 75 school districts. We did this with the Council of Chief State School Officers. Just 12 years ago, stated the problem. Six years ago was a piece of data that helped they used when they created the Common Core. And then I'm going to show you last year's. Because by the time they defined the problem versus solved it, the problem got worse. So they went to 75 high schools in the country, at least one in every state in the country, and they looked at 11th and 12th grade English language arts. 11th, 12th grade English language arts. And they looked at everything the kids had to read. And can I assume you all know, have a general understanding of what the Lexile framework is? 2,000 point scale for reading. And so this is, and I don't want to get too technical, but it's called the interquartile range. This is where 75, uh, the middle two quartiles uh, fell from the 25th to the 75th percentile of the materials. Now they do that because they don't want to be pulled by extremes. It really tells you nothing other than an opening reference point. They followed those kids to college. And it didn't matter if they went to a community college, to an Ivy League school, to a state university, to a liberal arts college, wherever they happened to go, and they looked at their freshman and sophomore English lit classrooms. And that's where it fell, which is exactly what you would think. We'd expect that the kid in college reads at a little bit higher level than the kid coming out of high school. The third column was our first kind of gee whiz moment in the study. Now remind me, what discipline was the first column? CLA. How many high schools? Third column, exact same 75 high schools but every other 11th and 12th grade classroom. And that's where they fall. Ooh. Every high school we've looked at in the country, bar none, English language arts has the lowest reading requirements. <laughs> and you know who did not know that? The English language arts teachers. You know who did know it? All the publishers. They have lost. Now, and I'm not even suggesting they need to change. But what discipline would you think would have the highest reading requirements. Yeah. Most people, 12 years ago it was science. Most people think it's science. Science was first 12 years ago, is now second. Math is third. Social studies is second to the bottom. Language arts is the bottom. Number one, career and tech ed. Career and tech ed. And the reason is, is they gotta read a manual. 12 years ago, the top of this line was right here. 12 years ago, the top of this line was exactly where it is today. Never moved. College other than English, uh, uh, English lit, freshman, sophomore year, the military. Uh, do you know that 34, last year, 34% of people who uh, attempted to go into the military uh, w and had a high school diploma already. 34% of them failed the admission test for the military. ASVAB used to be a placement exam. It's now an admission test. 34% uh, failed the literacy portion of it. <clears throat> military wouldn't take them. 
You know why? You know how critical technology is to the military? And you mess up a piece of technology in the military, somebody might get hurt. Somebody might die. Military, bars are very big because they're so prescriptive, but it's very high. We ask in each of 75 communities, total of 7,500 parents nationwide, to uh, tell us what they wanted kids to read in order to become independent as adults. Now, you all want your kids to be independent when they're adults? So what do they got to read? They gave us things like contract, insurance information, loan applications, material to get jobs. That's where it fell. We asked the 10 largest employers in each of the 75 communities, uh, 7,500 employers nationwide, give us what you want. I'm sorry, yeah, 750 employers nationwide. Give us what you want entry-level workers to read, entry-level workers. And that's where it falls. Please compare entry-level workers Personal use in the military to so high school English language arts. Finally, SATs, ACTs, and advanced placement. Lower than entry level jobs, lower than the military, lower than personal use. But we've treated college as a higher order academic skill than careers because it used to be that way. Selected colleges are still very competitive, but an awful lot of colleges are not. So the reading they need is technical reading. And we all the research. You want to do a good job in teaching reading, you teach reading in the blank area. What word did I leave out? Content. Content. Who's got to teach reading? Are you science teachers teaching reading? Are you career and tech ed teachers? Do they really know how to teach reading? Do they understand it might be the most single critical skill they got to teach the kids? Reading in the content area. But probably the most important skill is what we call quad D. I'd read your own read this. Five levels of learning. Just read it, if you would. When I say the word now, but not until I say the word now, I want you to yell out your personal opinion as to what two numbers on this chart you think kids will have to function at as adults to become independent. What two they will need in their personal lives and in the workplace. Is it one and two, or is it four and five? Everybody got the question? Yell out your answer now. Four and five. With two numbers on this chart, do you think we found nearly every question on every test in every grade on the state test in your state? One and two. We just defined the problem. We got the entire system fixated on one and two in a world that requires four and five. Now, doesn't mean one and two is wrong. You can't get to four and five if you don't have one and two. And you all recognize this, Bloom's taxonomy. He used to call it the knowledge taxonomy. I call it the rigor taxonomy. If you put academic rigor or blooms up the left-hand side, application across the bottom, A is what we are testing. And there's nothing wrong with A. You cannot get the B, C, and D if you don't have A. So that I'm not misquoted. A is essential. A is what? Essential. essential. But what I'm going to try to show you, I don't think it's adequate. College prep is C. And that's our definition of excellence. <clears throat> Career and tech ed is B. It's the real world application of basic academics. That's career tech ed. But career ready, in that world I tried to describe to you before break, is D. It's D. And we don't have it in our schools. 
And so when we heard college and career ready using this chart, we heard C or B. We didn't even hear and. Or if you were really enlightened, you heard and, and then you heard B and C. It's neither. <laughs> it's the rigor of academics integrated into real world scenarios. And here's the problem. Well, we got to get the D. This line right here is a wall we can't figure out how to get over in most schools. That center line, everything to the left of it, is how we are regulated, certified, tenured, contracted, bells ring, teacher ed program uh, prepare kids for, everything people and education love in a world that requires this. Because the problem is, this is all interdisciplinary. We got deep silos. School administrators, you got to figure out how to get over here. And that's what the highest performing schools did. The book will give you some background on that. Jack made an interesting observation at Wright. Right on, Jack. It says, in action, rigor, relevance, and relationships, where I'll take you after we have a discussion a little bit, is the high-performing schools approach this totally differently than the rest of us. What North Carolina joined the nation in doing in the last five years is tried to figure out how to get to uh, rigor, which was C. The nation's most rapidly improving schools didn't approach it that way. They said, I'm not going to start with rigor. Because if I start with rigor, the only kids I'm going to get are the obedient students. And what I got to worry about are motivating kids. If I'm going to motivate kids, I better understand their interests, their needs. Mm -hmm. We have something called a WE survey. We did 540,000 kids last year and their immediate teachers across this country. And when we did that, what we found is teachers consistently said, the content I'm teaching is relevant for students. But their 540,000 kids consistently said, I see no relevance in the content. Teachers said, I know my kids. The kids said, teachers don't know my interests. <clears throat> see, the high performing schools began with relationships. Then, based upon relationships, figured out what was relevant to the kids. Then moved to rigor. They went in the opposite direction. If you start with rigor, you'll do great with a third of the kids. You'll never get the other two thirds, has been our, our experience. You've got to figure out a way to break it down. There are ways you can break it down. Uh, you want to get the D? Eliminate department chair people. They're the ultimate gatekeepers to the past. Get rid of them. Instead, create chair people of interdisciplinary departments. Think of math teacher, science teacher, social studies teacher, language arts teacher, art music teacher, or career and tech ed teacher, or phys ed teacher. Give them the same group of kids all day long and give them a common planning period. Suddenly, what's top first period relates to second. But you know what else we learned from these schools? We learned that you'd better go slow. There's nobody more impatient about school reform than me. But I clearly learned that revolutionists get killed. You gotta make it evolutionary. So you know how I would begin? I wouldn't, what I just said, eliminate department chairs? I wouldn't start there. I would go to my principals and say, principals, try to find two or three teachers who like each other. And just approach them that like each other and say, would the three of you like to work together next year? If you do, I'll build a master schedule around the three of you. And I'm going to give the three of you the same te uh, kids all day for, in your three classes. And I'm going to give you a common planning period. And when those three make it work, guess what happens to two or three or four other teachers in the building the next year? 
they, could, they would like the same scenario. It takes about five years to change the system. Our problem is we keep reacting year by year to the latest mandate somebody else has imposed upon us. <clears throat> High performing schools took control, refused to be controlled by the latest piece of legislation <clears throat> and was not in a whipsaw constant reactive mode. They became proactive. And it will require a system-wide approach to get the D.